Welcome to the Kristen Super Crip Molest Check Ringside Report Show, Episode 2. We're here today with a special guest, uh, Zoe Midget. Is it Midget? Is that yes, and it's actually, it's actually Zoe, not Zoe. Oh, it's Zoe. Okay. Great. And who is, by her own accord, a rural ranch Democrat? And she is running to represent Oklahoma's third district in the U.S. House. So welcome, Zoe, and thank you so much for joining today and letting my viewers get to know you and the reason you're voting or running. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Thank you for having me, Kristen. Thank you. Okay, to begin, let's, let's find out a little bit about your backstory, um, your family background, childhood interests, where you grew up. Just tell us about your backstory. Okay, so I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. I was born and raised there, and I was a military brat. My dad was a uh, master sergeant in the Air Force, and so I spent a lot of my childhood um, trying to get away with things on military bases and sit in cockpits and have lunch and not get caught. Um, the going there, I went to the University of Arizona, and then I started work at America Online okay. when most people didn't even know what the internet was. And that was back in the days of DOS. So I started there as tech support, and I was one of three women in the country that did tech support. And we get a lot of calls where somebody would say, well, I need a tech. And I'd say, well, I am a tech. No, I need a real tech. But I am a tech and the call time at that point to get in to talk to someone was over an hour. I'm like I can release you if you want to try again, but I really can do your modem string for you. I promise. So with America online, that's how I found myself in Oklahoma. They were expanding and they were adding a call center to Oklahoma city. And at that point I was in charge of rewards and recognition for the center and in charge of, the team that kind of helped the teams. So when a, a tech support person would get stuck on the call, they would call my team for a solution. So those were my two jobs. And for the last two weeks before I got to move, they gave me the irate calls for two full weeks. So all I got was irate calls for nine hours a day, any call that got escalated. Uh -huh. And at first it was really, you didn't know how to deal with it, but it actually was the, one of the best things that ever happened to me because I learned how to, communicate with very angry people and make them happy and not just placate them, but really make them happy. So then we moved to Oklahoma. And while we were moving to Oklahoma for the startup is right when the bombing of the Murrah Center occurred. Mm -hmm. So I came to Oklahoma at a tragic, it gives me chills, a very tragic, sad time. Yeah. Um, but I also got to see Oklahomans at their best. And I was amazed by the spirit and the sharing and the caring of the people here. And the fact that the people would do anything for each other. Nobody sat back and just watched the news and watched the fire and rescue. They were out there on the ground trying to help. And I was amazed. Tucson, sadly, is not like that. Um, so I knew I'd kind of found home at that point. And we looked for rural land and we found a small acreage at that point in Lincoln County. And I started my horse ranch there. I'd always been a rider. I'd done three day eventing and I'd always dreamed of having a breeding farm. So at that point I started a breeding farm and my parents, let's see, it would be 2003 ish when I got pregnant with my one and only child. And my parents said, oh my gosh, it's their only grandchild, they're moving. So they moved from Arizona and came out. And that point we got, we purchased another 140 or so acres and ended up with like a half mile by half mile plot so they could live on the same property. So after my son was a year old, the horse market had kind of tanked. And while I'd been doing fine breeding, um, there really wasn't a market. Horses were doing some funny things. So I knew I needed to do something else. And at that moment, the owner of my feed store said, hey, 
I want to sell the feed store. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, I think I'm interested. So I talked to my husband. I have a year old baby and we decided to buy a feed store in Oklahoma city, knowing nothing about retail. Absolutely nothing. I knew the horse side and the animal side because I'd done four H and FFA and all the ag and raised steers and hogs and all that. But we walked into this feed store. I'm like, oh my gosh, what have we done? We really knew nothing. So, and I learned the plight, and I still learn the live the plight of the small business owner having to wear every single hat. You have to be yeah. HR, you have to be the tax man, you have to be the customer service, you have to be the guy that goes to get the office supplies and the insurance agent and all the things that a small business owner has to deal with. So it was fantastic. We've been doing that now. We bought the business on January 1st of 2006. So we've been doing that for quite a while. And at the same time, I continue with, at home, I have chickens and geese and ducks and horses and donkeys and cows, occasional hogs, lots of goats. And I live a small family ranch life at home, trying to produce for my own family. I do not have a green thumb. Don't ever call me a farmer. I am in awe of farmers. I can't grow a thing. I try, but I can't. So that brings me to where we are now. And that's my history, probably longer than you wanted, but that's pretty much it. No, no, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. And that's pretty incredible story. Did you say your son was born in 03? Did you say the year? He was born in 04. 04. Pardon my, me? My daughter was born oh, in four. So that's why I asked. I, I have one okay. daughter and she was born in 03 as well. So they're close in age. Um, so I'm going to be inserting some fun questions throughout our interview. And for my first fun question, um, do you have any particular sports that you played or you really enjoy watching or any teams, um, either locally or professionally, that you really like? So I don't really get into professional or college sports. I am a U of A Wildcat fan by default. Okay. Um, I've done three-day venting at the international level. For those who don't know what that is, that's when you do jumping, dressage, and cross country. And I've played water polo. And I enjoyed water polo very much. I was a synchronized swimmer, which is really corny, but it's really hard. So I, w I did swim team. But my favorite sporting event if you want to talk about something, I'm going to sit down and watch hardcore is the Olympics. There is not one event in the Olympics that I don't enjoy watching. To me, that is the true spirit of sport. And I usually watch it by eating a lot of junk food and admiring the people while I eat really bad food. So um, the Olympics are really important to me. I try to even take time off from work. Oh, nice. Nice. That sounds like something I would do <laughs> to watch the Olympics. Um, for my next question, uh, you, do, you describe yourself as a small agribusiness owner and a rural ranch Democrat. Um, what does a small agribusiness look like? And you've already talked a little bit about that, so you don't have to go into much more detail about it. But um, what does being a rural ranch Democrat entail? What it means to me, and the reason we came up that with that title, my team and I, is we were trying to find a uh, quick and easy way to explain that I understand the day-to-day -day living of the small farmer and rancher, the small business owner, the mm -hmm. life of living in a rural community with bad connectivity um, and a lot of other services that are limited, healthcare, and those kind of things. So I'm not out there trying to, oh, I don't know how to quite word this, I'm not out there trying to change the status quo as much as support the people that are living life like me. And I don't feel that our current representative does that. He's all about the big business and letting the big business have a pass while not having any consideration for the small producers. And our small producers, when I say small, they're, they're pretty big, but they're still getting their, their fannies kicked by these international corporations. So, and back to the business, our store is kind of specialty. It's kind of interesting. We are the only English store in Oklahoma that I'm aware of for English equestrians. And we actually get commerce from surrounding states. There's a, we have families that come from Kansas and Arkansas to our store to get fitted for their show outfits. Wow. At the same time, I do full um, feed consultation 
And we also sell chickens, we sell guinea pigs, we sell ducks, guineas, um, quail, you name it, pheasants. And we also do small like mini pigs and llama alpaca farms. So I kind of wear like all the hats of agriculture in that place. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. And um, when did running for Congress first occur to you? Was that like a aha moment or was it like a gradual building up to that or how did that happen? It was an aha moment and I've been told it's not the best story, but it's the honest story is I found myself, my, I used to make fun of my cousin for spending his weekends watching football all weekend and not doing anything. And I'm like, why don't you go do instead of watch? Get up off the couch and do. And I caught myself watching Facebook and Twitter and Facebook and Twitter and the news and Facebook and Twitter and the news and getting more and more frustrated and angry with the way the world was. Mm -hmm. And um, one night very late, I went to the Federal Election Board and filed to run for Congress. <laughs> it was that yeah. quick. You know, I feel like so, I relate to this a little bit. I'm taking my action <laughs> a different way, but I get it. I get it. Uh, so my, another fun one. <laughs> Uh, I'm a huge animal lover, and I'm assuming you have a lot of experience with animals um, from your business and what you've told me so far. Um, so with dealing with a variety of animals, do you have any pets? And would you say you have a favorite type of animal that you care for? Oh, gosh, no. It's They're all different and they're all unique. I have a turkey right now that runs to my cart and jumps in my lap for treats when I get home. So that turkey is really a hoot. And then I have, I love my cats. I love my dog. My dog will see a cat and go after him like nobody's business. If I could clone him, I would. <laughs> horses are my true joy. Um, I love horses probably the most. Mm -hmm. But I even enjoy when we're raising a steer that we know ultimately is going to be food. I usually treat them like a pet because I feel like his whole life should be as best as it can possibly be. So as corny as that sounds, um, no, there's no favorite animal. I really kind of love them all, but they all have their quirks that make me smile in different ways. I love that answer. I love that answer because I love them all too. So I get <laughs> that. Um, can you describe for us in your own word, your opponent, the incumbent you're running against and why you think you're a more worthy candidate uh, for this position? I'm more worthy because I actually care about the people as individuals and their life, whether they're Democrat or Republican. I don't care about their politics. I care about making their day-to-day -day existence better. My opponent has been in office since 94, and as one of his constituents, I can honestly say he's apathetic. He just goes around and... The only time I see an appearance from him is when he's brown nosing or schmoozing with a large company. So I don't see, it's been a year and a half since he's been in the panhandle. I looked it up when we went to the panhandle, he hasn't been there. And those people are dealing with issues such as a four hour round trip to go to a pediatrician mm. and in four hours round trip to go to a Votech. And for one gentleman, it's 10 hours round trip for his kidney dialysis. And that's multiple times a week. So he doesn't seem to get it or doesn't want to get it that he's supposed to be a representative, not just a dude having fun and playing with the big kids and going out and, and schmoozing. That's not what the job is. And I think that, that my district is not unique. I think there's a lot of representatives that forget the name is representative. It's about everyone in your district and listening to them and caring about them whether you agree with their politics or not is irrelevant. You're there to help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I did not include this in my questions, but since you just touched on it, I did think about asking about that. I noticed you had said on your campaign site that you were the bipartisan alternative. Um, and I, even though you're running as a Democrat, it sounds like you're trying to take an approach that is more considerate of both parties' needs. I think that's really important. And I think just voting the party line is the wrong thing to do. I think that's one of the reasons we have so many problems right now in the house mm -hmm. in getting things done. And yes, I am consider myself a Democrat, 
but I also have an entire family that's full of Republicans. And mm -hmm. I love those people greatly and care about them greatly. So I can understand and I want to work with them, not work against them. And it's the same as the people. So I'm not just locked into democratic policies. I'm locked into what does district three need and how can we make it better? And I think it's more grassroots than a lot of people when they're running for office talk about, I'm going to fix healthcare. Well, or I'm going to fix whatever, or, you know, and that's great. That's wonderful. But they've got to start where they're coming from first, fix where you live and then fix the greater thing. Mm -hmm. If you fix where you live, the other stuff takes care of itself, I think. So. Excellent. And speaking of your opponent, Frank Lucas, uh, you challenged him to a debate on September 1st. Did he ever respond to that challenge? Uh, no, not at all. No? Not even a snap, nothing. Just well, crickets. Oh, that's Kind of says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, you've also mentioned transparency as being very important to you, and um, you believe is deserved by the people in your district. How do you plan to make yourself and the work you're doing as their representative more transparent uh, if you were to be elected? Um, I would post about the things that I know people are going to cheer about and also post about the things that they're going to go, why did she do that? But be open to discussion about those things and why I made that choice to vote that way. I get frustrated. Trying to contact Mr. Lucas is like trying to call a call center in India at 3 a.m. with a broken dishwasher. You don't get anywhere. You get a canned response and no satisfaction. Now, being realistic as much as I would like to speak to every single person in the district, that can't happen. But to be transparent means no canned answers. I want a tally of the things that my, that my staff is hearing. I want to know what's going on in people's mind. I want real responses to the people. Mm -hmm. And to get, if you've got 50 people saying something's broken, it's my job to listen and see if I can fix the broken issue. And being very honest, I've always been very honest, which is um, sometimes a fault in some regards because I shouldn't say the things I do, but I really am straight up just who I am and will tell people what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Great answer. Um, and as most of the people who are watching this I already know, um, I have a disability, I have a form of muscular dystrophy. Um, I'm a lifelong wheelchair user. And so when it comes to policy um, and, you know, uh, running for or voting for uh, how people consider you, you individually and your needs, um, policy that affects people um, with disabilities is always important to me. Um, and specifically, one of the issues that's really big deal to me is uh, access to affordable and accessible housing and access to what they call home and community-based long-term services so that people who are unable to care for themselves, whether they be disabled, whether they be elderly, uh, whether they be vets with injuries, um, that they are not forced into a restrictive living environment like a nursing home. Um, what would you do to support initiatives that support this more independent lifestyle, like access, uh, access across America, for example? So, God, you asked me a lot in that question. There's a, know, lot, of, I, there's a lot of things in that question. First of all, let me tell you just me day to day. I support ADA a thousand percent. But in my business, we are so crammed full. When we have a customer that comes in a wheelchair, they can't get around. And we know that. So we turn into, okay, this is the wheelchair spa spot. Tell us what you need and we will bring everything to you. And we pamper them like they're a queen or king. And small businesses, and that's what it should be. I wish they could get around with too packed. It's just not possible. But we've always gotten excellent response from all of our disabled patrons. And we have repeat customers that are considered disabled. Um, you talk about affordable housing. 
I'm behind it, but I don't know what you mean or what you're speaking to directly. Are you I have to ask you a question. So say you're, you're in a wheelchair and you want to rent an apartment. So you go to a place and you want to rent an apartment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, ideally, you need an elevator or ground floor. One of those two mm -hmm. options, but preferably probably not an elevator because in the event of a disaster, you're, you're trapped. Right. The ground floor. At that point, where do you want me to go from there? What? Help me. Well, to give you a personal experience example, looking for um, accessible um, apartments, there's usually only a couple of units with the kind of space uh, that's considered accessible where with a, with a power wheelchair like mine that's kind of big and bulky that you have the turning radius you need, you know, to move Got around it. in the bathroom and so forth. So they might only have one or two units uh, in an apartment complex in the first place that are considered wheelchair accessible. Um, are they more expensive by default or are they the same price? Um, sometimes they're the same price, but sometimes they're actually more expensive, um, depending okay. on whether uh, the, the, it's considered subsidized housing. Um, okay. Subsidized housing makes a big difference, obviously, uh, for more affordable, accessible apartment. Um, but because there's only a couple of units uh, per apartment complex and uh, you have to venture out and try to find accessible houses to rent if you can't find any available units and apartments. Um, it's just, you know, the, the rent is usually higher for houses than it is for um, apartments. And um, most people that are living off of, say, uh, SSI, um, which is like what I've lived off of most of my life because you actually have to pay into the system to qualify for social security disability um, right. because it's an insurance, you know, you're paying into it when you work. Um, so if you're born with a disability and you're already at a disadvantage to being able to do certain types of work and they therefore can't pay into it and you're only getting supplemental security income, um, you're getting even less. And so um, the cost of living, actually, even though they say it's supposed to be lower than the amount that you're getting, is not. Um, Got, it. Got it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when we say affordable, accessible housing, it's that most houses and most ap apartments are not accessible in the first place. And then you have to pay even more to try to find. So, yeah. Well, I can tell you simply... I'm 100% in support of your needs and others that are in your situation. That's simple. But I don't have the knowledge base to tell you what I would do. I'd have to learn more. And that's, that's the honest truth. I'd have to learn more about um, the accessible living and the issues there and how to make it work and make it fair. Because you have to also think about, I'm thinking about, always thinking about both sides. If I'm an apartment owner, what do I have to put forth to make it fair for you to live there? And can I afford it as an apartment owner, no matter how much I want to do it, sometimes it's not feasible. So at that point, the government should be stepping in and subsidizing the apartment owner to modify an existing unit is what my think thinking is. Mm -hmm. So then it's a win-win for everybody. But I know that's not probably occurring right now. In terms of assisted living, this is, you're going to think I'm making this up, but this is the truth. Watching my parents age, I was always concerned. I always think about the elderly, especially the old GIs, my dad's buddies, mm -hmm. and what's going to happen to them when they don't have someone or if they don't have someone to take care of them. Mm -hmm. And I always had this kind of dream of building a huge assisted care facility that was not a prison. It was designed to be a place with gardens and animals and a real center and it would be all the rooms would be identical and you would only pay based on your rate it's kind of like the shades of green in, in um, Orlando there's a resort there at Disney World so if you're a private the room may cost you a hundred a night if you're a general the room costs you a thousand a night and I always thought that was a neat way to set it up and I always thought that 
these, a lot of the nursing homes are kind of icky and prison-like and not a nice place to be. And they should be just the opposite. And there's so many great stories in there and people that want to share their life experiences that are just getting lost. Mm -hmm. And it becomes like, it becomes like a dumping ground for people that no one wants to deal with. And I don't like that. And yes, I support you a thousand percent. (laughs) I just don't know exactly what I need to do at this moment to support you, I guess is the best way to answer the question. And that openness to be listening and listening to ideas is exactly what I want to hear. By the way, just for your, an FYI, access across America, you do get uh, voting in. This is a a policy initiative um, that was proposed by um, disability advocacy groups, um, such as ADAPT, that it it partners HUD um, with uh, agencies that provide those community and home-based services um, for, as you were describing, kind of alternate integrated living situations and other forms of housing where people can have their needs met without having to live in those types of nursing facilities yes. you were describing. So there you go. Now you got a tip or pointer of where to start. Thank you. Now. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next one, another fun one. Um, what's your favorite movie of all time? Or um, you can't think of a favorite movie, a favorite actor or actress. Okay, G.I. Jane. G.I. Jane? With Debbie Moore. I, I don't know why I can watch that movie over and over again and never get tired of it. Okay, so that's the movie, yes. G.I. Jane. Okay, all right. It makes a powerhouse woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cool. All right. And then finally, our concluding question, um, using this opportunity to tell your voters or just anything you want about who you are and why they should vote for you that I haven't maybe already asked you, um, what do you want to tell them? Basically, (laughs) Basically, I'm just like you. I care about your needs. I care about what you're dealing with and I want to make it better. I want to be the voice for all of us in District 3. And by making District 3 better, we make all of America better. Because there's a lot of problems in rural America that need to be addressed now. So that's why you should vote for me, because I actually care about the individuals and not the lobbyists. Love that answer. And we at Ringside Report support you. Um, I obviously already scoped you out a little bit before I did this interview and I love everything I read. I loved everything that you've had to say. Um, I really think that all across the country, really, uh, we need change and we need more people like you. So um, thank you for running and stepping out on that limb and doing what you're doing. I appreciate talking to you, Christian, and thank you for the thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Have a wonderful night. You too.